Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it is happy morning time. I love our greeting time. I've got one short announcement. I don't think I've ever said anything about social media, um, but we have uh, Christina Bueller actually helping us with our social media presence. And uh, one of the most valuable reasons for that is that uh, people find out about our church oftentimes through seeing a video or a short clip on a reel or on a uh, you know, some kind of post on Twitter or on Facebook, and um, it's not easy to find a church that fits your convictions and your beliefs and that you believe is trustworthy, and we want to be known. We don't want it to be the reason why people aren't checking out Boone's Ferry because they've never even heard of us, and so I think there are a good number of people that attend Boone's Ferry. Almost everyone that I talk to, how did you hear about us? It's through something like a social media. They saw us on uh, an advertisement on YouTube or on Facebook or on Twitter, or they looked us up by just searching for us and found something. And um, so these little clips that we're editing and videos that we're putting on and the entire service that we're streaming, they've been an effective way that God's been using to draw people to our church. And uh, I think coming to Boone's Ferry is a blessing to people. People find themselves relaxing and feeling like this is really a home for them and a place where they can have community, study God's word, uh, grow and pray together, and also figure out how to serve the Lord with their gifts. And it's, it's a powerful thing. And when that's missing from people, something really significant uh, is missing from their lives. So my, my point is that um, any way that you actually engage with social media is beneficial in driving engagement. Now, I want to say one thing. I used to not be involved in social media at all, and uh, just because couldn't handle the smoke, as they say these days. And uh, so if you don't use Facebook, if you don't use YouTube, if you don't use Twitter, and that's like kind of a conviction of yours, I've got no energy to convince you to do so. But if you're already using them, and maybe a sermon was meaningful, you guys can encourage me so much with specific statements about how the sermon helped you or what you appreciate about the sermon, uh, consider posting that on Facebook. It takes you five seconds to just post something on there. People say that. Consider sharing it with someone that you think would be blessed by the sermon or something like that. And um, it's sort of a miniature way to also practice evangelism and outreach, even if that outreach is to other Christians. And uh, so I just thought I would tell you that even a thumbs up, anything like that is, is helpful. Um, so I'll say no more about that. I, uh, I want to pray, and then I've been excited all week to get into Timothy, in particular this passage. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and the way that uh, you cause it to go out from you and you bring it back with, and you never bring it back without having accomplished its purpose. And so you're effective at using your word to transform and save and uh, draw people to you. And that's just amazing. And we thank you that you're using some of the technologies that exist to, um, to bless Boone's Ferry through that. And so we pray that uh, anybody that you're leading to help in that way or just put thoughts in their mind about, hey, I actually will post about this. Lord, we pray that you, would, uh, that you would use our individual efforts in that way. And now as we turn our hearts to your word, we pray that you would, um, they would use your word. And sometimes we need worldview transformation. Other times we need to be reaffirmed in what we already believe. Sometimes we need to be challenged. Other times encouraged. Other times consoled. Whatever people truly need in their spirits from your word today, I pray that you would supply it. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have been excited to teach about this passage for a long time. We are already in 1 Timothy chapter 3, so I'd like, to turn, I'd like you to turn there with me already, and uh, I'll just start reading chapter 3, verse 1 through 13 is where we're at. The saying is trustworthy, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. I hear people whispering here. But uh, therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, a husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, and hospital. And <laughs> I can't even continue. We're not, we're not going to skip chapter 2, verse 8 through 15. And you better not let me ever get away with something like that. So I insist you fire me if I skip passages like this. But nobody said anything. So maybe next time just raise your hands like, excuse me, we're not in chapter 3 yet. No, and I really don't even want to skip the passage. I've spent a lot of time studying this throughout the years, and I think this passage is really good, and I think we forget that, and there's so much uh, powerful teaching from Paul here. So let's start over. Um, I actually had the sound guys put the scriptures up there. They knew what we were doing, but um, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. 
And Paul's continuing to teach about um, church order and the way that he wants the church to be organized and what he wants it to be about when we assemble. Verse 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but what but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control." Let me back up from there and introduce an idea that I think might be helpful understanding aspects of this. Um, I'm not a builder. I'm not really a handyman, and I never have been. My dad hasn't been in his life either. He was an evangelist in small groups and one-on-one with Campus Crusade. Um, But there are ways in which um, I think it's important to know how to fix things in your home and do some of those things. You can save quite a bit of money in doing that. And... uh, I've had friends help me build an outdoor house that will probably partly be an office for me, but mostly is a play space for the kids, but having fun doing that. And so I'm actually doing and have been doing a lot more of that kind of work than I really want to be doing or that I'm skilled to be doing. And one thing that I have noticed, I don't know if you handymen and guys that really know how to do stuff out here agree with this, but I cannot stand Phillips head screws. I can't stand them. They're so poorly designed and they always strip. And you know, When we use tools the wrong way against their design, then you can expect them not working. But there are so many times where, you know, you can't quite get the uh, screwdriver to go at the angle it needs to go and you're trying to do it and they always strip. But a Torx screw, almost never. You have to really jack up a Torx screw. And so I just think, why don't they just make them all Torx screws? If someone has an answer for that, I'd love to hear it. I'm not sure what application Phillips head screwdrivers actually or screws actually have. But um, there's no way getting around when you misuse a tool, you're going to mess things up. And uh, since I don't really know what I'm doing, I don't even know when I'm sometimes using a tool in a way that it's not intended to be. Um, So I try to keep things simple. For example, I bought myself an electric lawnmower because you don't have to deal with the, the gas and any other thing. And, you know, gas is more complicated than you think because you can't just let gas sit in that lawnmower forever and uh, just you know, you notice the rhythms, the rhythms of grass growing, like it doesn't really even grow in the winter, so it's just sitting there, and then you have to empty it out. So these, the, the new, I don't know how new the technology is, but the battery-operated, non-cordless, uh, you know, I think the, I forget the line that Home Depot carries, but mine is Greenworks, a different one, and so I bought a whole Greenworks battery system. And I know very little about electricity, but it does fascinate me, and uh, so you can't really put a 40-volt battery into a 60-volt uh, lawnmower. Uh, the f- one that I have is a 40 volt, so my 40 volt batteries uh, fit in there. And if, if I know anything about electricity, which I really don't, and I have listened to some guys that do, voltage is measured in potential. And so if I, you think about that 40 uh, volt battery, it has the potential to power a 40, 40 volt um, uh, uh, lawnmower. And when I did some research to try to figure out, could a 40 volt battery in any way power a 60 volt uh, lawnmower? I, it was unclear. Most people said no. And the simple answer is no, because their, their fittings are different. But if you could fit it in there, would it actually work? Would it actually move the motor? And my guess is from looking at it, and maybe some of you guys know, is that it would at least be very underpowered in that way. So if you use batteries, with less voltage potential than they uh, actually need to power whatever tool, it just doesn't work. And some of the answers were it could burn up your motor, like it'd mess it up, especially if you do it the other way around, 60 volt battery in a 40 volt uh, um, lawnmower. And this concept of potential energy or potential power of voltage, potential voltage period, I wanna take that and, and talk about a concept called potential authority. Okay, I doubt you've probably heard this. Maybe you've heard this concept in some way or another, but this is extremely important in understanding this passage and coming to it with the right attitude is the concept of potential authority in relationship to actual authority, okay? When we're talking about the potential of voltage, that's like, I think, something like how much power energy it has in potential, 
Right? It's just sitting there. It's not powering anything, but it could power something with this amount of potential. Any less wouldn't be able to do it probably. Well, with God's word, when we're talking about potential authority, it just has all of it. Whatever the maximum is, it has all of it. And the way that that's different than actual authority is, let's just take a verse that has authority. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That's Ephesians 4.32. And so all of us Christians ought to agree that that passage has all potential authority, meaning it's true for everyone all the time. There's never a time where someone sins against you where you should not forgive them. But sometimes we don't forgive. It's just a fact. I bet you can remember a time where it took you a long time to forgive. It's not quick. You didn't keep a short account in this case. That's when you're not actually obeying, okay? And there's a big difference between saying that God's word is potentially authoritative and then actually always living it out. I don't think any Christian should ever say that they obey God's word perfectly. Does that make sense? Like we're not sinlessly perfect. So there'll be times where we don't actually obey. But you shouldn't then go back and say, see, the Bible was wrong. I don't even have to obey this. So since you didn't forgive, now you don't even have to forgive. When you unseat the potential authority of God's word, you do something actually far worse than just disobeying one time. Because how does it work when you disobey something and then you realize you're wrong? Well, it's like God's word comes to you and convicts you. It says forgive, and I'm not forgiving. I feel convicted through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then you change your mind. You repent or confess that. You change your mind, and you decide by the power of the Spirit to actually forgive. But if you go back and then say, no, the Bible isn't actually authoritative in that place, then there's nothing left to convict you. You've unseated the authority of the word in your life. And people do this all the time. They do it all the time. So when I say, you know, you can kind of forget about the voltage, but it's an idea. If you try to plug um, God's word in and you are giving it less authority potentially than you're supposed to, it won't power your obedience motor. It will not power your life. That's using God's word against its design. So we're going to come back to this idea of potential authority versus actual authority. We need to obviously give this passage full potential authority. And yes, you have to figure out what a passage means in order to give it authority into your life. But once you have figured out what it means, then we need to let it be true, and that's how God's word works. And here's the last thing I'll say about that before we get into the passage, because we're coming back to that, and we'll talk about it more. When you unseat the potential authority of the authority of God's word, even in just one place, you actually unseat it in every place. Let me say that again. When you decide that one part of God's word is not authoritative, you're really deciding that all of God's word is authoritative. You may not have actually decided that you're going to obey none of it now, but what you have done is you've set the precedent that you don't have to obey certain parts of scripture. And I'll tell you what, your flesh, that sinful desire in your life that we're all born with and I'll continue to carry even if we're saved, it will always want to say the opposite of whatever scripture is saying when you don't want to do it. Sometimes there may be things in the Bible that you want to do, that you think are good. Other times, it becomes very difficult to actually do those things. And so you look for every way for a passage to say something that it doesn't actually say so that you don't have to do it. And that is a very dangerous thing to unseat the potential authority of God's word. I hope that makes sense. I know you can all understand it, but I just hope I explained it in a way that, uh, that makes sense to you, and you'll figure out how this becomes um, way more important later. We need to allow God's word to teach us the design of his church, the design of our relationships, the design of uh, roles of women and men in church, and then we need to follow that design. And when we do, you're going to learn from this passage that there's incredible blessing in that, Powerful protection and really satisfying purpose. Incredible blessing, powerful protection, and satisfying purpose. So there are three sections here. Paul says something to men about anger and quarreling and prayer. Paul says something then to women about modesty. By the way, the part about anger and, and quarreling and prayer applies to women too, but it is addressed to men. The part about modesty is addressed to women, but applies significantly men to men too. And then Paul says something to women about teaching and exercising authority. In, and, and so each one of these sections, I want you to think of it like this. I want you to think about there is great blessing and protection and purpose in doing 
the, God, uh, what God told us to do here, doing what God designed, using the right battery, so to speak, and trusting the potential of authority of God's word to then help you actually follow this and obey. So we'll go through three sections. The very first one is in verse 8. I desire that, that then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And, you know, I don't think Paul was only talking about prayer, so we could probably elevate it to ministry. Anytime ministry is going on, Paul uh, desires there not to be um, anger or quarreling, but he is specifically talking about prayer. And you might think of, you know, why would he talk about anger and quarreling when it comes to prayer? Isn't prayer the time that we're least likely to be angry and quarreling? And in my experience, no matter what kind of ministry it is in the church, uh, anger and quarreling are always closely related to it. And when you think about it logically, it makes perfect sense. Few things are cared more about than religious convictions. If you have a conviction from God's word, because you say it has all potential authority and you understand it a certain way, you're going to care. Whenever you care deeply about something, your emotions are engaged. So when you care about something and it's contradicted, you might get upset. It, ma it makes so much sense to me that you see a lot of people getting upset in church and even quarreling because people really care. And yet Paul is saying, don't do that. In another place of Ephesians, Paul does say, be angry, but do not sin. So it's not that the anger itself is the wrong thing. It's when anger leads to the kind of quarreling that's sinful, or when anger is sinful in itself, like you might turn into contempt. You leave anger too long. You let the sun go down on your anger. You wake up the morning already mildly bitter about something. You, you know, what's the saying? You, you, know, you got out of bed on the wrong foot or something like that. That often happens to me when I haven't settled something the morning or the, the evening before. And so anger ought to be cleared every day. That's really important. I will also say this. You know, sometimes anger is actually righteous and good. There are certain things that we should be angry about when we see an injustice, it's right to be angry. But I have found that even when my anger is righteous, the enemy can tempt me to take that to a sinful place really quickly. And I've had to draw very strong boundaries so that that doesn't happen. Um, your heart, when it's angry, oftentimes struggles to differentiate between what might have started as righteous anger and is now all of a sudden just sinful anger. And the difference really is something called self-control. When you start stepping out of self-control, and I don't mean self-help self-control, like the kind of self-control you can like do white knuckle and just discipline yourself. I mean the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. When you allow the Holy Spirit to be control of your anger, it doesn't step out of bounds. So you might be angrily discussing something because you really care so much, but you don't malign the person's character. You don't say mean or vicious things. You don't cheat in the argument. Ever been tempted to win an argument by cheating, saying something you know it's not true, but will win the argument for you? You know, um, it, it happens so easily when you're angry and you sort of feel justified in it. And Paul knows that that kind of anger and quarreling will interrupt the prayer ministry. It does every single time. So there's, the, there's a purpose in praying, and specifically when it says, I desire then. That word then harkens back to something. So Paul has just gotten done saying something, and so he says, so then, you know, I desire then. And what he was talking about could be summarized in the idea that God desires us, or that, that God wants us to pray for all people because he desires to save them. So there's an evangelistic kind of prayer that's going on here, but all, all kinds of prayer for all kinds of people is what's in view here. So the prayer ministry of a church is so quickly interrupted when we allow anger and quarreling to happen. And we ought not to be like, oh, you're angry and quarreling in church? Of course you are. You care about it. You care about it. But I guess I overstated that. Not of course you are. Of course you're going to be tempted to have that happen. But the fruit of self-control can do something, or yeah, the fruit's called self-control, can do something that is amazing. And I just want to, because I have had to deal with anger issues for so long, especially because that was one of the main sins that I committed willfully and intentionally when I walked away from my faith, used anger as a way to play more violently on the field. It was like a performance-enhancing emotion kind of thing. And uh, so I've had to undo those tracks that I built. And um, I've learned a lot about anger, and I hope this is really uh, helpful for you. One of the most powerful things I've learned about anger is that it is really a blanket feeling, and there are so many other emotions underneath it. Uh, most of us 
will probably experience some kind of temptation towards anger or anger when someone is directly thwarting our will. You know, you know who does that all the time? Children. <laughs> so you might experience some anger towards your child when you know they're doing the exact thing you told them not to do and they know they shouldn't do it. And so you experience anger. Adults do that too. And oftentimes far more strategically and uh, in intelligently. And so now you're like, it was so premeditated. I'm so angry at this person. So someone thwarts your will. But even that is not as deeply as we ought to think about anger. So when someone thwarts my will on something, it's not just that I'm angry because I didn't get my way. That's part of it. There's fear of the consequences of what that might mean. So if, for example, you're trying to lead someone to do a certain thing that is good for them and that has consequences in the church or consequences in their life if they don't do it, uh, you can think of kids or friends, and then they do the exact opposite, you might start getting upset that they're doing the opposite because you know that it's gonna to lead to disastrous consequences. For example, if you never teach your children about authority and the consequences of breaking it, uh, you can almost guarantee that a strong-willed child is gonna end up being a juvenile delinquent. I don't know if that's the word people use these days or not, but they're gonna end up struggling with authority in general. And authority comes up everywhere. Everywhere in life there is authority and you have to, when people have a broken relationship to it, it's oftentimes because they have a broken relationship with their parents and it does not set them up well in life and then they get angry in relationship to authority over and over again. So I think about these things and I might actually be fearful. One emotion that oftentimes leads to the blanket feeling of anger is fear of a certain unwanted outcome. And you know what? When you start thinking like this, you know what? I'm partially afraid and that's why I'm so angry and begin to you know, I think these days they call it emotional intelligence. When you start being more self-aware and self-reflective, and honestly, I can't do it without the Holy Spirit. I need him to, sometimes I don't know why I'm angry. I don't even know. And I ask the Lord, what is going on? And when he explains to me what I'm actually upset about, it all of a sudden, instead of seeing red anymore, I am starting to realize what's going on. And it cools the jets. And I realize, okay, this is what I'm really upset about. And, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic that, the solution to this actually is to go right back to prayer. When you get angry, um, one of the best things you can do is to ask God why you're so upset, help you, help him, uh, have him help you pinpoint it, and then pray about that very thing. Because um, fear can quickly dip into an area where it erodes your faith. Like you can trust God with the outcome of the future, even if it's gonna be bad. You can trust him with it and he'll tell you that and he'll reassure you. And so then you take the driving motivator of maybe the base feeling of fear and it begins to dissipate your anger. It's an amazing thing. That's one thing I've learned about anger. Another thing, far simpler, when you get angry and you know it's tempting you to the point where you're probably gonna lose self-control, walk away. Walk away, give yourself a breather, have you ever been so angry and you were certain about something, you walk away and like even minutes later, whatever you thought you were thinking sounds crazy and just not right? Anger can warp your mind and sometimes the really mature thing to do is actually to say, hey, I'm really angry about this and I need a moment and you walk away. I think far too often as couples or as friends, we try to push through and resolve the conflict while we're white hot in anger and we just need to back away from that. So... Uh, I could say a lot more, but the idea of identifying what are the root feelings and then, the second, and, and then taking that to prayer and the second one of just walking away, you, if you establish those patterns, it might really help you with your anger or quarreling. Um, maybe one last thing that's directly related to this. We have convictions. We ought to have convictions. And humility is the thing that allows anger to be present even without quarreling. So you might be somewhat upset that someone is contradicting your conviction, and that's just fine. And if you're humble, you realize that God's got it. And he doesn't really need you to make sure everything's okay in the world. He doesn't need me to make sure everything's okay in the world. We have our jobs and our influences that he wants us to exert and certain responsibilities. But if you can be humble about your convictions, so like, yes, I believe this, but God's ultimately in control, it may just help calm you down from the ways in which anger will just spiral out of control about future projecting of unwanted outcomes. That's all I'm gonna say. Here's what can happen if you do not allow anger and quarreling to interrupt the prayer ministry in the church. There is incredible blessing, there's great protection, and there is satisfying purpose. So 
we have a prayer ministry where we pray on Wednesday mornings, we pray on Wednesday evenings in the discipleship communities, we pray together as, as elders with anyone that ever asks for prayer, we pray in the service oftentimes, and there are all kinds of ways that you can join in praying in the actual prayer ministry in the church, and when that happens, we're seeing amazing results uh, people asking for advancements in their career, for provision, for we've, we've had seen uh, multiple times where legal cases and outcomes were dramatically changed and God's hand was all over it. Things like, how did, that doesn't even make any sense that it happened the way that's so God's hand. So when you pray, one of the blessings that prayer uh, brings into your life is that it reaffirms your faith that prayer actually works and that it creates this virtuous circle where you want to actually pray more. Another thing that it does is it draws you into closer relationship with the Lord because as God teaches you to pray, he will bring you into agreement with his word and at a heart level. So it says, seek first the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you begin to pray. And maybe initially it was all about your requests, but then you start requesting things for the church. You watch God answer those requests and you're still asking your own things for what you want. You watch him answer that. And now you're starting to get into that purpose place where you feel like you are um, somebody that God is uh, using in participating and accomplishing his will through prayer in God's church. It's very powerful. Protection might be the easiest one to understand. For If a church is praying, praying for our children for literal protection, praying for protection from false teaching for the kids and from bad influences, praying for each other for healed relationships and for strong relationships and praying for unity in the church. Uh, church splits are so nasty and destroy so many relationships and that's exactly what the enemy wants. So you can see how an uninterrupted prayer ministry that's not uh, the focus isn't taken away to individuals' disagreements and all this quarreling has great blessing, protection, and purpose. Mo some of the most satisfying things that happen in my life are a result of asking God for something for the church or for myself and then watching it happen. You're just deeply satisfied. So let's move on to the second one. You can see how <clears throat> if we pray according to God's design, blessing, protection, and um, and, uh, and purpose. Verse 9, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearl or costly pearls or costly attire, <coughs> but what with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. First thing I want to say just quickly and then move past it, there's a way to understand this legalistically. And it's, it's not just that that's like the right understanding of what Paul's saying with the wrong heart. I think it's the wrong understanding of what Paul's saying also with the wrong heart. What Paul is saying here is that he's calling the women to adorn themselves in a spiritual way. And so he's saying, I'm not talking about like the outward way primarily. I'm talking about things like modesty and self-control and godliness and good works, spiritual things. But it's, it's not the same thing as him saying, you can never have braided hair, you can never wear gold or pearls or costly attire. When you do that, you take it back out of the depths of what he's really saying into the shallows, and that's why it's legalistic. You clean the outside of the cup, but on the inside you're like empty tombs, Jesus said. That's what legalism does. This is, this is not less than outward modesty, that's important to say, but it's also far deeper than outward modesty. So when you think of the kinds of ways that you are to um, adorn yourself before the Lord, uh, you, you have at a heart desire the desire to please him with that adorning, with the clothing you're wearing, the things you clothe yourself. You can clothe yourself with modesty and self-control and godliness and good work. So once we understand this rightly and not wrongly in legalism, then it's not like, oh, like all these rules of what I have to do. It's a heart level devotion. And so, but let's start with the shallow and then go deeper because it does at least mean that we ought to be uh, modest. And almost everything in this passage is uh, controversial, but I think that can sort of warp the way that we talk about it, almost like we need to apologize for it or be unnecessarily careful with it. Um, I do think there's at least one or two things that require uh, some sensitivity here in this passage. But in this case, let me just dispel a couple things. Um, People can use passages like this to sort of command women to dress a certain way with an unlying attitude that any lust that men might experience is the woman's fault. And that's not what Paul means, and that's not what I believe. At the same time, 
a loving way to relate to a man, knowing that they have weaknesses in the area of temptation towards lust, would be to dress in such a way that doesn't reasonably bring that up. Uh, so, for example, uh, I think this is not a Christian environment, but I will go to, uh, you know, a gym and almost any gym that I go to, uh, most of the time I'm just kind of looking down around on the ground because women are dressed in a way that is like, I don't want to see it. I don't even want to look at it once. To be honest, some of the ways that people dress these days, I think both men and women, um, I wouldn't even take in the category of, immod of immodesty. I think it's lewd. Uh, and it's far more extreme than that. For example, uh, this particular gym that I go to has a... Uh, uh, a pool deck, an outdoor pool deck, and women these days will be wearing lingerie. It's not even a swimming suit. It's, it's lingerie. And so now taking that out of the shallow, like, eh, you shouldn't wear this, you shouldn't wear this, to like, what's the heart desire underneath it? And maybe one of the more valuable things we could think about is not just as women, but like as fathers with your daughters, what's the real reason why you would want your daughter to dress more modest? Remember, we're still in the shallow part here. This isn't about the kinds of things that are deeper, like godliness and devotion to the Lord and good works, but it's at least worth starting here. Um, one of the deeper reasons why I would want Ariel to dress more modest is because I know the kinds of men that are attracted to either lewd or immodest clothing. And they're generally predatory, and that's not an, they're just looking uh, for one thing, and you know what it is, and so you're going to attract the wrong attention from the wrong men. And so I want to uh, speak to my daughter in a way that secures her, that makes her feel beautiful, that makes her feel confident, and that recognizes the kind of man, not men, but the kind of man that she wants to attract will be attracted to that kind of modesty, and it sort of starts from the outside. Um, good men are not attracted uh, by, uh, you know, shorthand, it's a Kardashian behavior, you know? That's not, I mean, that's like the incarnation of immodesty. And uh, again, not, not to judge those women, you could pray for them, but they are role models for many women in the world. And it's all materialism and beauty and the, just the barely even skin deep kind of stuff. So, I think the fathers should be uh, thinking that out of love for their daughters, teaching them how to dress more, um, more appropriately in that way. Still though, I think some of the context that we're experiencing today would have been so foreign to Paul. You know, lewdness is a whole different thing. I think lewdness all by itself, regardless of what your heart attitude is sinful from the beginning and just should, should not be allowed. But it's not gonna end in our culture. It's only gonna get worse. So it's... It's, it's a matter of the church actually standing up and teaching and, and modeling the right thing. And when you do it legalistically, you'll get nowhere, right? People know the hypocrisy of that when you're just acting like you're better on the surface. But when you, remember everything in Timothy is about truth for love. When it's love in your heart that you realize, you know, and, and again, we could leave it all just with women, but it's not really true. Men these days are wearing far more revealing clothing. And, you know, modesty isn't just in clothing either. Like you can brag about the Ferrari you have and you can brag about the good life you have. I feel like a lot of Instagram accounts are just intentionally immodest. You know, look at all the things that I have and all the things that I do. Uh, so it's the spiritual desire that's the issue. Um, if what you're wanting is to impress other people, men or women or your social circle, that's the kind of immodesty Paul's not talking about. Um, and uh, he, that is the kind of immodesty Paul is talking about. But the kind of modesty he's talking about goes far, far deeper than just not trying to impress other people. It's about pleasing the Lord. And so again, when we allow our lives to be designed by the Lord all the way from what we literally wear to what we spiritually wear, uh, it, it's, it leads to great blessing, protection, and purpose. I think there are a lot of disillusioned young women that realize that they've just been used by men and, uh, and that there are some things that they may have done that uh, made that you know, sort of a greased track, and, and it's just a very negative spiral for them. Um, it never leads to greater self-esteem or greater self-value or greater self-worth. Uh, and, it, it, and it interrupts our relationship with the Lord to live like that because we're not actually seeking to please Him. And so it's a very unprotected way of living to live immodestly. Uh, but it's a very protected way of living 
to be modest. And it's also very purposeful because you're thinking about loving your neighbor as yourself. You're thinking about things that will lead to a closer relationship with the Lord. In particular, uh, the kinds of good works that flow from focusing on what pleases with the Lord. It doesn't please the Lord for you to commit yourself to, uh, to materialism. Again, can you have pearl earrings? Yeah, you can. Can you have a Gucci bag? Yes, you can have a Gucci bag. But it's, is that what you're really after? Look at the heart. Whether you're a man or a woman, look at the heart of this. Are you living life modestly because you want to grow in self-control? You want to grow in godliness? Maybe um, just one more thing before we move on to uh, the section that will get by far the most time in today's uh, sermon is regarding self-control and modesty. Uh, this might be sort of a neighbor to it, but I think it applies, and it uh, very much applies both to men and women. When you're living a self-controlled life, you are not easily offended. Let me say that again. When you're living a self-controlled life, you're not easily offended. Modesty uh, begets a more robust inner nature that's not as easily offended. And it's not about you having a thick skin. It's about having a sober view of who you are. People that are the most immodest and most about presenting their own greatness to the world have the most to lose when someone says something negative about them. And so they fight that hard and they're so offended and there's like that, how dare you talk about me that way? You see that in so much social media because the goal is to look a certain way when someone says something about you that hurts your reputation, you are going to explode. But when you're at the foot of the cross and you know that just your sin alone required Jesus to die for you, that's the son of God, the only perfect one to die for you, then in that case, it's just so much more difficult to offend a person like that. Because you don't think so highly of yourself. You're not living a life that's meant to display how great you are. You're living a life that's meant to display how great uh, the Lord is. And so there's, I think, a modesty that's actually about glorifying the Lord with your life rather than glorifying yourself. And being offended and getting offended is one of the major issues of our age. It interrupts people understanding each other. It leads to broken relationships. It leads to these screaming matches and quarreling, right back to the first verse eight there. And <clears throat> it's just so unnecessary. It never leads to deeper relationship with the Lord or with one another. So you might want to think, you know, consider, are you convicted? Am I easily offended? Do I easily get upset at what people are saying? One of the most negative things that being easily offended will do is it'll cause people to back off from speaking the truth in love to you. And I'm not going to say it. They always react so poorly. So people that are not easily offended are more likely to hear people saying things that might be admonishing or corrective. Um, and you might say, well, I don't want that, so I'm not going to do that. But the reality is uh, I don't think I can think of very many examples where I've grown significantly, at least, in my faith without some other person having to show me what was wrong. Uh, a lot of the places where we have to grow are in spots where we're blind to the problem. And so, again, I think it's part of self-control and, and modesty to not to think too highly of ourselves and therefore not be too offended if someone says something that maybe the Lord has a point in. Even if they don't really love you, maybe the Lord might be using. I think of the story of David where he uh, actually listened to the words of, of an enemy because he thought maybe this is the Lord speaking to me. Maybe I deserve to hear it this way even. That's a humble attitude towards correction. All right, moving on. But I think we can see how when we live towards God's design, all kinds of good things happen in our life in terms of blessing, protection, and purpose. Verse 11 through 15 are all kind of about the same thing. And it's about uh, women's roles and men's roles in church. But again, Paul is primarily addressing, addressing women. So you might think, well, it's not fair. He's, why is he talking so much about women? Uh, I will talk about men here too, but the primary reason is because the focus in this case for Paul is women. Here, let me read it one more time. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she's to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now, there are a lot of things here that if you have not studied this passage before, you might be like, huh, I don't get it. There are other things here that are quite simple and straightforward or maybe hard to accept. And this is where I want to come back to the idea of the potential authority of God's word. Um, 
And so first thing we should say is like, this is authoritative, this is true. And you should say that even before you fully understand what it's true, because you're reaffirming the potential authority of God's word. And then when you come to this passage, you do have to ask yourself, what does it mean? There are some legitimate questions about what this actually means. It's interesting when in our discipleship community, I asked the question, it was the written question that we're going over, what does it mean? Um, someone said, they were zooming in in this case, like, well, it means exactly what it says it means. And I think that's true. I think it means exactly what it says it means. But that still doesn't mean that that defines all the ways that we might apply this in the church. So you might ask, well, let a woman learn quietly in all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Is this like a total gag order? Um, well, you know we don't believe it is because we just got done having a greeting time and no one was telling women to be quiet and that would never happen in this church. So it's not that. Um, well, also you hear Emily speaking on stage and sometimes maybe sharing something devotional about how the word that she was reading is really a lead into the content and heart level message of this particular um, worship song. We also don't think that's wrong. So like, what are we really talking about? And I think the two verses have to be taken in conjunction. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness all by itself is not exactly what Paul's saying. He's saying that in the context of the teaching ministry and the authority ministry in the church. Um, so let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. What it means in the simplest terms is that the teaching ministry is something that is um, limited to men and the uh, main, in scholarly terms, ruling, I think ruling is a, a word that gets misused. And so I put it, the, the, the top level leadership is to be men and not women. And I think this is a very simple thing to understand, but it is so counter our culture and it has been attacked as chauvinistic, I've heard it called bigoted, which I don't think is even definitionally the right word to use. Um, there's another word with M that escapes me. I know someone has it, uh, uh, say it. Misogynistic. misogynistic, there we go. Yeah, it's been considered misogynistic. And you know what, it totally could be. If you're misogynistic and look down on women as less valuable than men, less intelligent than men, somehow just lesser altogether in relationship to the Lord or relationship to the value they have in serving the church, uh, it could totally be that way. And if you're a chauvinist, it could come off that way. But Paul was none of those things. Paul worked with women closely and had very close relationships with women like Lydia and Phoebe and Priscilla. And so, and, and so do we at this church. Uh, Emily is our uh, worship coordinator. Becky is our, um, uh, our uh, operations uh, manager. And uh, my wife is our children's director. So we have women in significant roles of authority and leadership. And uh, Christine is teaching downstairs all the time. So we're not saying that women can never teach. We're not saying women can never exercise authority. It's, it's very specific. And Paul gives two reasons, and this is really important. The first reason is that Adam was formed first, then Eve. And verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And now you might have a whole lot of questions. I want to focus most of my time on talking about why this passage is so good, not why it gets contradicted so much. But I think there are some aspects of contradicting this passage that I want to talk about. And first, the first kind of one that will happen is a word will be taken, like the word for authority, which is authentane, and then a verb will be supplied into it. So for example, the reason why Paul was saying that women couldn't teach or exercise authority is because there were women in the church at Ephesus that were exercising authority abusively. And so what he's really saying is, no, they're not to exercise authority abusively. But the word authentain has no necessarily pejorative or negative connotation. It's just the word authority. You would have to supply the word abusive. Another uh, idea that's supplied to this passage rather than read out of it is that women at Ephesus and in general in that ancient context were not educated. What's true is that women in that context were not as educated or as uh, pervasively educated as men. What's not true is that they weren't educated. 
There were wealthy women that followed uh, uh, Paul around his ministry and, and, and wealthy women were almost always educated. You have to do sort of junior sloppy scholarship to say that women weren't educated. So it's not even true in the first place. And you can actually go to, uh, this is kind of a proud moment for me. My dad has this doctorate in the early Roman house church and wrote a book called House Church and Missions. And Dr. Roger Gehring, he never calls himself that, but that's who he is. And uh, he wrote about this and the ideas of like, what I call uninterpreting this passage, uh, came uh, out of, uh, maybe not originally, but were powerfully put forward in the very school that he got his seminary degree in. And uh, so he has a whole part where he treats and is uh, you know, a scholarly debate uh, with a woman by the name of Elizabeth Schusler Fiorza or Fiorenza. And uh, she was one of the ones that was bringing forth this idea that women are not educated back then. And so it was really only uneducated women that shouldn't teach or exercise authority. Another example of supplying something in here. And, and so for one, I also want to say, you could refute this scholarly historically, and we could argue about that. Well, were women educated? Were they not? But you could also just look at the passage and say, those are not the reasons Paul gives. Paul gives reasons that are directly related to creation order. And Adam was formed first and then Eve. And so that's true not just for the church of Ephesus, but we all have the same creation order as our history. So when you hear people saying that this is rooted in creation order, what they're saying is it's not just contextually true. It's always true for every church for all time. That's what we mean by creation order. I want to back up from that because I think here's what's really happening. When you don't want a passage to say what it actually says, uh, you can find all kinds of ways to, to do that, to have it say what it doesn't actually say. And it comes from a desire that needs to be checked at the door. It needs to, you, you need to be emotionally intelligent and self-aware uh, by, the, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit to realize, wow, I really don't want this to say what it says. If you have that desire to want it to say what it doesn't say, or to want it to say something that's far more limited than what it actually says, because you don't like the ramification of what it says, you will be primed and ready and tempted to find arguments for how it doesn't say what it actually says. And I wanna show you that in more uh, specific examples. And you've all heard about infant baptism or believer's baptism, right? I think this is a classic example of interpretation. We're a believer's Baptist church. We're convinced from the New Testament that only believing, professing Christians, we will uh, baptize young children when they have a believable profession of faith. But the reason that we believe that is that every single example of baptism in the New Testament, literally every single example, has a response to God's word preached in some way or another and then a public profession of faith. And there are no examples of children being baptized and not a single teaching to do so. However to be honest and not go too far, there's not a single prohibition to do it either. And so when I hear what I consider genuinely faithful, maybe Presbyterian ministers, that would be an example of a denomination that's generally infant Baptist, not all of them though, say that they're convinced that infants should be baptized because the sign of the old covenant was circumcision and the sign of the new covenant is baptism and children were uh, as infants circumcised and so we should infant our infants should be baptized too because that's the way you enter the Old Testament covenant community. And so now you're going to enter the New Testament covenant community that way. I believe that's their strongest argument. I'm not uh, convinced by that argument, but I still believe this is a matter of interpretation. So the point is not that we don't sometimes interpret things differently, but there's a big difference between saying that there's an interpretational difference between infant Baptist and believer's Baptist and saying that this is just a matter of interpretational difference. There is a prohibition here. It says don't do it. It's clear and simple, and there's nothing in the passage that would lead us to believe that it only applied to one church context in all the history of the world. So I don't actually think this is a matter of interpretation. And, but what has happened is, and you know the categories, I don't know if this started in seminary or where it really happened, but you can normalize something by saying it enough. If you say enough times, there are three reasonable views, egalitarian, soft complementarian, and either complementarian or hard complementarian. Um, and these are all sort of orthodox views and the views that the church has held and they're normal and we shouldn't divide over those. And you say that often enough and enough scholars say it, it becomes normalized. It's like, oh yeah, it's an interpretational issue. But in most interpretational issues, there isn't 
clear, explicit prohibition or saying don't do this or do that, there is, there, there is gray area left where it's not 100% clear. In this passage, there's nothing unclear. You have to supply ideas from another place. You have to add verbs. You have to change Greek words. You have to say and undo. It's what I call uninterpretation. And that might sound extreme uh, because I'm not saying that egalitarian Christians are not Christians. I'm not saying soft complementarian Christians are not Christians. I'm saying that what I really think is happening behind the scenes is that they started with the desire for it not to say what it actually says and then found reasons to back that up. And I, I really believe, and this is the most negative thing I'll say and then back off from that, I really believe it's intellectually dishonest. I think it's intellectually dishonest to say that. And you may disagree, I'll give you one more argument for why and then uh, let you decide on your own, which is always the case. You need to have your own convictions from, from the Bible. It's relatively meaningless if you only believe it because I said so. You need to believe it because your spirit accords with it and because you believe it's what the Lord's actually saying. But for example, I've heard over and over again, especially in egalitarian circles, and I traveled, trafficked in those circles because I went to George Fox University, which was predominantly egalitarian. So I have lots of friends in ministry. I have friends that were hard complementarian that transitioned all the way to egalitarian or just to soft complementarian. Maybe if you don't know those terms, by the way, egalitarian means there's no differences between women and men in terms of their roles. Men can, women can be teaching in any ministry and women can be leading in any ministry. Soft complementarian says, no, women cannot be elders, but they can teach like I would be teaching on Sunday mornings because they're teaching under the authority of the elders. And complementarian or hard complementarian says um, that women are not to teach or exercise authority over men, and so uh, eldership is prohibited, and the teaching ministry of a church to the entire assembly is prohibited. Okay, so that's the categories. Probably should have defined that at the beginning. Um, so hopefully that, that helps you kind of think through what was just said. And over and over and over again, I've heard the idea, and it always comes from egalitarian circles, that these are not divide over issues. At the same time, it's from that circle that I have been called misogynistic, bigoted, or prejudiced against women, or harmful because I'm restricting something. And so I look at that and I'm like, well, which one is it? Is my view a reasonable view, or am I a bigot? Which one is it? Is you have this underlying contempt for one of the views, you ought not to say that you think it's a reasonable view, but it's always this kind of both. Um, so I think there is, there's deep problems with trying to say something that the Bible doesn't say, and I don't think it's just a simple issue of interpretation. My great fear uh, in this case, the kind of thing that could tempt me to anger in relationship to the people that disagree, and so I'd have to be self-controlled there. Um, my great fear is that if you unweight the potential authority in a passage like this, you're gonna mess with God's design, and it's gonna have far greater consequences than you might think, and I wanna, I wanna show you how. So. We've got some time left. I would like you all to turn with me. It's going to be on the screen, but if you've got a Bible, it'd be great for you to know um, the creation order in the first place. Otherwise, it might be kind of understand. Uh, Adam wasn't deceived? What do you mean? He ate too. Wasn't he deceived too? What does it actually mean? I want to show you a couple things. As you're turning there, I want to say <laughs> something kind of blunt force, straightforward. Do you know the reason why we can know that Adam wasn't deceived? Because God said so in verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, you know? So I like to just take it at face value, even if I don't understand it, and like, well, he must have not been deceived. Whatever he did was definitely sin, um, and it, I don't think it was a lesser sin than what Eve did, but it must have not been deceived, and the woman must have been deceived because it says, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Both became transgressors, one not through deception. So let's read about this. This is uh, Genesis chapter 1. And we're just going to read 3, 1 through 9. We could read more, but you'll see the reason for that. And you already know from chapter 1, chapter 2, God created Adam. First thing he ever said wasn't good was that Adam was alone. Then God creates Eve out of Adam, and Adam looks at her and is like, now this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Different than all the other animals, this is one like me. And God talks about how he made a helper. That idea of being complementarian comes from the idea that God created a woman as a complement to man. Just saying that people get so angry about, but it's just, it, that's actually what scripture says. But now let's read about the fall because that's what Paul is talking about, this idea of uh, Adam was formed first and then Eve. 
and um, then Eve was deceived and not Adam. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was in, to be desired to be, make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. The eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? There's so much we could talk about. I really only highlight one thing. And it's actually my wife's observation. And I was amazed by the point that she was making. And it's very true from this passage. And she said, you know, I'll be upstairs with Noah, putting his diapers on, putting him to bed, and I hear some kids screaming right after something that sounded like a smack. And I'm going downstairs quick, and I'm like, who done it? I'm looking for the kid that smacked the other kid, you know? And so you could probably guess who it was most of the time. In this case, it wasn't that kid. It was a different one. And so she found that person, and then she figures out what happens, right? And then depending on how much fault or whether actual rules that we have that trigger certain kinds of disciplines get administered, she then administered that discipline. But her point was, I go to the first offender every single time. That's who I go to. And I was looking at this and I was like, God doesn't go to the first offender. He goes to Adam. We know from the passage that the woman took and ate first and then gave it to Adam and he ate. Why is God going to Adam? And her point was, and I think this is exactly what the passage is saying, is that God is holding the man responsible. He created him first. He's the leader. He's the person that God holds responsible. You would normally go to the person who did the thing first. If we read on, he said, I hear the sound of the, uh, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree. <clears throat> By the way, never before in the history of marriage was a woman blamed for a man's sin until that moment. So we have a long-standing tradition and this is where we got it from and it's not good. Um, so, and that's some of the reaction you get. If we'll go back to Timothy here, the idea that uh, some, someone made the joke about, is this where we get that uh, a man always gets blamed for a woman's sin? And I thought it was funny, but uh, no, it's, it's actually really dangerous to think that way because um, anytime you try to point to someone else for the thing you did wrong, it interrupts the conviction, repentance, and forgiveness cycle. You need to take responsibility for the thing you did wrong. And in this case, the woman was deceived Adam wasn't deceived. He just did what she told him. It even says in this passage, because you listened to the woman. So there is, there was, it's not like God saying you should never listen to your wife. Of course you should. There are times where she, filled with the Spirit, is telling you things that you definitely need to hear. And he, he is given uh, uh, marriage partners for that kind of thing, mutual edification. But what really should have happened is that the husband should have stepped in and led in that case. And what Satan was doing was very deliberate. He was subverting God's creation order from the very get-go. And I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but one way to know what Satan's doing is just to look at whatever is exactly opposite of what God has told us to do or what we are. If God says that marriage is between one man and one woman, Satan will say, no, it's between a man and a man and between a woman and a woman, and you can do whatever you want. If God says there's just two genders, both made in my image, and uh, then, then Satan will say, no, there are this many genders, and you can just change your gender whenever you want. It's it's far less subtle than you might think. He can be subtle, but it's always just blunt force uh, uh, opposition to God under the hood of things. And I was reading a scholar by the name of Andreas Kostenberger and um, found what he had to say just really insightful. I'm going to read this slowly, and uh, it's probably too long to read twice, but listen closely here because it's so powerful. And he's talking about 
what Paul is trying to avoid in the negative. Uh, so there was this creation order. It got subverted. And if it stays subverted, God's design is thwarted and bad things happen. You lose blessing, you lose protection, you lose purpose. But if you go back to the original order, the way things were supposed to be designed, there's actually great blessing, protection, and power, and purpose in that. So here is what he says. Negatively, Paul was concerned that the people in the church avoid the scenario that had precipitated the fall where Satan deceived the woman. The role reversal had been complete. Rather than God being an authority over the man, who was an authority over the woman, who were an authority over the animal world, including the serpent, the pattern prevailing at the fall was the exact opposite. The serpent tempted and deceived the woman, who exerted leadership over the man, and both rebelled against God and transgressed his command. Both positively and negatively, therefore, Paul directs that the man, not the woman, function in roles of ultimate leadership and responsibility for the church. So, we need to go back to the original issue. We need to go back to the original design. One thing we can never have back this side of the grave is non-sinful natures. Adam and Eve got to uh, experience a time, we don't know how long, where they were not sinful towards each other. And man, what a marriage that would be if it wasn't with two sinful partners. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Such a tragedy what was lost. But just because now there's fallen nature and we're born sinners and we have to overcome that by being justified and indwelt by the Holy Spirit and mortify our flesh, you know, put to death the misdeeds of the flesh by the Spirit regularly and over and over again, um, just because that's the case does not mean that God's design is still not best. All kinds of terrible things happen when we subvert, change, modify God's original design. And it, uh, it is itself a sin to do so, and it is a, um, <coughs> ultimately a matter of God's glory. And I want to, before we move on to what uh, verse 15 really means, which is also somewhat tough to understand, I want to go to Ephesians, and I have this up. I'm just going to read this quickly and make about as few comments as I made about the Genesis passage, maybe even less, because marriage is actually about God's glory. Did you know that? Marriage is about the glory of Jesus Christ and particularly his relationship to the church. So verse 22 of Ephesians says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of the water, a washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, <coughs> because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let one, each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There are roles that God has designed for our marriage, and he knows that these are the creation order roles. They haven't changed, they are not to change, and they are ultimately about displaying Christ's relationship to the church. Did you know that's what marriage is about? It's an unbelievably powerful thing. Now you might think, well, I'm not married. You know the way that you display the glory of Christ's relationship to the church when you're not married? By devoting yourself all the more to Christ. You know, Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians, just got done reading it the other day, that it's better not to be married than to be married because you can devote yourself more fully to the Lord. So we get to this passage, uh, this verse, yet she shall be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Um, I don't believe this verse applies only to childbearing women. I think it's incredibly painful. This is what I was talking about, being sensitive about it um, if you are a woman and want to have children and you can't because of some kind of medical issue, even just talking about this is a painful thing and I understand that. Uh, but you do have an opportunity to devote yourself all the more to the Lord. God has left you a purposeful, protected and blessed way to glorify his relationship to the church. An amazing way. In ways that Paul says are actually 
more potent because you can devote yourself entirely to them. And uh, so if I were single and I did not believe that I was called to be married, uh, that is what I would do because uh, anything else just seems like a half-life to me. It seems like, well, I, I don't want to feel constant pangs of loneliness and I feel like I'm not achieving my purpose because I'm not being fruitful and multiplying and I'm not uh, doing these things. I would just think, well, Lord, all my time's yours. How do you want to use me? I wouldn't do this perfectly, but I th in potential, I think that's what the word says. I think there's great power in that. Regarding women being saved through childbearing, one thing this definitely doesn't mean, it would be works righteousness if it meant this, is that literally the way that you're saved, like don't go to hell and then go to heaven kind of saved, is that you need to have children. Not true. I wouldn't be surprised if there are cults and pseudo-Christian hybrids that basically say that, but you know that's not true. So why the word saved? I think it's a matter of sanctification. Um, justification is when God justifies you by uh, giving you the gift of faith, choosing you, giving you the gift of faith, and bringing you uh, to believe in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is something that Peter and other passages where it actually says that we are to work our salvation out with fear and trembling. You already have it. You're already justified. Work that out with fear and trembling. Or as Peter says, make every effort. So when it comes to growing in faith, effort is actually involved, and that is not works righteousness. When it comes to being justified, effort is not involved. That would be works righteousness. So when it comes to being saved through childbearing, think of all of the ways that God blesses women in terms of their spiritual growth. You want to know what it's like to, to be God and have children? Be a mom. My goodness. Kids, like, they almost never thank you early on. I remember I wasn't 20, I wasn't until 25 years of age that I started realizing just how much my parents had done for me, right? Maybe the first time I gave them a really satisfying and meaningful thank you was around that time. Maybe not everybody is as rebellious as I am, but Man, uh, being a mother is thankless. It can be painful. It can be lonely. I think the mothers in this church, uh, whether you're you know, past the age of having kids or in a grandmother now or something close to it or whether you're a young mother, uh, you know how isolating it can be to be home with your kids. You've got to pack them all up into the car and th uh, just to go and hang out with somebody. I think mothers feel really lonely. So there's, there's so many ways that motherhood and childbearing connects you to what God experienced when he became a human being. He even talks about himself in motherly terms, in terms of, uh, you know, um, gathering uh, his children to himself and how he bore us and how much he loves us and cares for us. And you want to learn how not to be selfish? Become a, a mother or father, my goodness especially little babies who need their diapers changed. And then you change their diapers, then they need their diapers changed right again because they weren't done. And it's in the middle of the night and you just, oh man, it's intense. And yet the greatest, sac uh, the greatest uh, sacrifices also lead to the greatest satisfactions. My goodness, there's such a powerful purpose in just as a mother giving yourself to it. This is my job. It's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glorify the Lord with it. And you give yourself to that all the way, and uh, man, mothers that do that generally have amazing relationships with their children when they're older. It's so satisfying, so purposeful, and uh, so I think that's what we're talking about, the sanctifying kind of salvation and sort of the undoing of what went wrong in the curse in the first place. And someone said in the discipleship community, and this is such a powerful point, you know, we wouldn't have Jesus except for one woman bearing a child. So God's entire plan for actual salvation was also done through the very thing that got so messed up in the garden in the first place. So I think there's so much power and purpose in this. And when we don't contend and um, when we just allow the Bible to be authoritative and take it straight forward and trust that it's good, there's incredible power. And I believe that the best way to protect yourself from uninterpreting passages, from saying things that they don't say, is, is humility. At the end of the day, when we're at the foot of the cross, uh, there's just this willingness to accept things that confront our flesh. You notice how I haven't said that the women, reason women can't teach is because they're too emotional? It's because that's not what the passage says, right? So I also think we shouldn't uh, supply things that demean women in ways. You know, I think there's some truth that men and women are made differently, and it's not necessarily demeaning to uh, talk about the ways that we're emotionally different. We're emotionally different too, but 
Those arguments are weak because there are a lot of, there are men that are emotionally more, um, more expressive and more uh, moved than, than some women. So the reason is just very simple. It is God's creation order. That creation order was subverted and we need to go back to the original creation order. That's what obedience is. So um, that's how we're designed at a church. Uh, just, I feel like I maybe haven't applied this enough uh, regarding uh, just some practical things. So one, a couple last things I want to say is that we will support the women that are leading within the callings that they've given, get, been given uh, strongly. And we believe that there is no such thing as a gendered gift. So do women get the gift of teaching? Absolutely no evidence that there isn't. Uh, I just think it needs to happen in, in its proper context. In, I think it might be in 2 Timothy, <clears throat> maybe be in 1st too. Um, I've been reading both of them, so sometimes I get them mixed up. But uh, the idea that older women are to teach younger women, teach. You're also to teach your children. There are so many ways in that women should be, um, uh, you know, uh, chosen, developed, and empowered to go and teach. They have things to teach. And the reality is that uh, um, there have been many things that I've learned from women myself. My mom would be one of the foremost that I would put forward. So uh, it's, it's not as restrictive as some people might think when you don't make it legalistic, but there are some restrictions and when we order ourselves this way, there's incredible protection. So much disunity happens when churches transition away from this passage. People leave, people walk away. Um, uh, families are, are harmed in the sense that when you subvert the roles between men and women, the marriage doesn't work the way it should, you know? So we really need to just listen to God's design and follow that. Um, and when we haven't, Again, the cross is the answer. So today, when you go to communion, um, it may not even be this passage that you've been unseating in its potential authority. It may be another one, but think about that. Have I decided that there's an area where I'm in mastery over God's word and I need to let that go? He's our master and he's better at it than we are. He knows what leads to life and what leads to death. And he knows that the enemy is lying to us about it. Maybe it's specifically this one and your marriage has been upside down and, and you need to allow yourselves and support each other in filling out the role. You know, the wife is meant to role play the church as a method actor, so to speak. And the husband is to role play Jesus as a method actor. It's so powerful when we elevate our minds about how important it is. So God's glory is at stake in actually allowing his design to be front and center and he will bless it, he will protect it, and he will give you satisfying purpose in doing so. So when you come forward to communion as Emily comes up today and leads us in worship, consider the areas where you are convicted or challenged or uh, even in just encouraged to order your life the way God has designed to be ordered. And it's, it's worth doing. You're going to experience incredible blessing, protection, and purpose when you do so. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this congregation that is so affirming when your word is taught simply, straightforwardly, clearly, and with a heart for love. I do pray that we would order our lives according to your will, order our lives the way that you initially made it that was good, and that you would strengthen the partnerships of marriage in, in our church, that you would strengthen those that are, that are single to devote themselves to you in an even more focused way and that you would help us to remain focused on how your word leads us to loving you and towards others, and that we would never become legalistic or rules-based at this church. I pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.